breaking boundaries with compassion. Breaking boundaries with compassion. That's a hard title for me in some ways because I've told you and I believe boundaries are good. So we need to understand the type and the kind of boundaries. So please don't read that to say all boundaries are a, are a game for breaking. There are some that are imposed upon us by others than God. And it is those boundaries. The boundaries that God did not set, but others take upon themselves to establish. Those boundaries that I would challenge. Not me. I, I wouldn't challenge them unless I knew that I stood on good ground with my Lord and Savior Jesus Christ who challenged those same boundaries when He was here. You can follow along as we study this message together. In Luke chapter number 6, verses 6 through 11. Luke chapter number 6, verses 6 through 11. where we see Jesus demonstrating the true purpose of the Sabbath. It was given to Israel to benefit all mankind. It was given to Israel to demonstrate God's mercy and kindness, His goodness. It was not given in the sense of the strict legalism that the Pharisees had espoused by the time Jesus walked the earth. As we read these verses, we're going to notice by healing this man that we encounter with the withered hand, on the Sabbath, Jesus is illustrating for us that compassion takes precedence over rigid law-keeping in the sense of traditions that the Pharisees had made. Jesus did not violate any laws of God by helping this man. And yet, this would set in motion towards the trajectory that would culminate in the cross of Calvary. That's how important this moment is. And what Jesus does, He does not do lightly. In fact, other Gospel writers tell us that He was angry. Now, when I mention Jesus in the context of anger, like me, you probably first and often think of Him overturning the money changers' tables. And I had to go look at the other accounts, and I had to go read Mark and see, did they actually use the word angry? And Mark did. But Luke doesn't. Luke does not use the word angry. In keeping with his purpose for Theophilus, I believe, the Holy Spirit moved him to not include that detail. And the Pharisees are the ones that Luke tells us have the anger in them. And I don't know, anger is kind of an easy way to put it. We're letting them off the hook by me saying that they were angry because they were just, I don't know how to tell you this, they were out of their mind in rage. Blinded. By their, by their anger so much that they couldn't see the truth staring them in the face. And I think the King's English is fitting on the word that's used by Luke. But through this, and their misunderstanding the law's intent, Jesus is able to expose their hypocrisy and emphasize that doing good is lawful to the shock of the Pharisees even on the Sabbath. Doing good is lawful. Read along in verse number 6 of Luke chapter 6. We're told, And it came to pass on another Sabbath that he entered into the synagogue and taught. Another gospel writer tells us that this was their synagogue, the religious leaders. He goes into their synagogue. I don't know which synagogue this was. Was it the one at Capernaum? I don't know. We're not given the specifics as to which synagogue it is. But he entered into the synagogue and taught. And that right there to me is gracious. What a gracious Savior we have that he would 
he would actually set foot inside those doors again. After having defended his own disciples in their hunger, out in the, out in the byways and, and, and out in the marketplaces and the streets, out, out in life, he defended them out there. Now, Saturday comes around and he says it's time to go into synagogue because that's what you did. And this was his habit. This was his custom. He entered the synagogue and taught. And there, there in the synagogue, there in that place, was a man whose right hand was withered. Verse 7, And the scribes and Pharisees watched him. Whether he would heal on the Sabbath day, and why were they watching? For the purpose of that they might find an accusation against him. But he knew their thoughts. And any time Luke tells us that he knows their thoughts, this is not going to work well for the people he knows their thoughts for. <laughs> he knew their thoughts. And I ask you, how can a man know someone else's thoughts? He knew their thoughts and said to the man which had the withered hand, Rise up and stand forth in the midst. And he arose and stood forth. Then said Jesus unto them, not to him, to them, I will ask you one thing. Is it lawful on the Sabbath days to do good or to do evil, to save life or to destroy it? And looking round about upon them all, he said to the man, Stretch forth thy hand. And he did so. And his hand was restored whole as the other. If it just stopped right there, we'd be okay, wouldn't we? Read verse 11 out loud with me. And they were filled with madness and communed one with another what they might do to Jesus. Lord, I pray that you would open our eyes that we may behold wondrous things out of your word. Guide me today and help us to understand that this world is unfriendly because it's unfriendly toward you. And I pray for the Christian that's here today that has just sought to do good to others and to try to do what's right, Lord. I pray that you would encourage them along their way. And, and I pray for those in our midst that need the truth of your word to open their eyes. I pray that nothing would hinder that. That you would help us to grow in your grace and knowledge and learn of you. Because as I was challenged recently in a message I heard, that is where we find rest when we take your yoke upon us, when we learn of you, for you are meek and lowly in heart. Lord, give us your spirit today, we pray and beg you in Jesus' name I ask to hide me behind the cross. Amen. Imagine if you would, um, walking down a busy city street, the traffic's heavy. Crowds are moving fast, and you suddenly see it. There's a person laying on the sidewalk. Now, this happened to me the other week, right down here. I was going down 80th, and there was a person laying on the sidewalk. Now, the authorities had already come, and they were dealing with this person on the sidewalk, but um, it, it wasn't going well for that person. They were getting help, but, you know, just imagine somebody's there and you notice them and maybe they're injured. I don't, I don't know what you would imagine them being, but whatever the situation, they're in need of help. But maybe the more shocking thing that we see happen so often is that no one stops. Nobody, nobody even calls. No, maybe what they'll do today is they'll get out their smartphone and start YouTube in it, right? What's going on here? i got to catch this next footage so I can influence people. 
Nobody stops. Everybody's too busy. Just moving on, focused on their routines, focused on their destination, rushing to their job, rushing to work, rushing to the next meeting, rushing to that next appointment on the calendar. Hey, I'm not talking to you. I'm talking to me. If you can see my calendar, I am talking to me right now. Because I have gone by people that I probably could have stopped. Now, please hear me well. We live in a very dangerous world. And it is an unfriendly world. And if you're not equipped or prepared to help somebody, or you think it could be a lure, please be careful. There used to be a day where you didn't have to worry about that as much. And you could tell usually when somebody genuinely needed help. At least it was that way where I grew up. I don't know where you grew up, but where I grew up, we stopped and helped each other because everybody knows everybody in a small town. And likely, you know, it's likely that you're going to know the person that needs help or know the family that needs help. But the world's gotten so large, so many people, it's hard to know who's who anymore. It's hard to know who to trust and who you can't trust. And I say this often. It's not that I don't trust anybody. It's just I don't trust anybody. So I'm not talking to you. I'm talking to me. I've gone by and and I, I wish I would have done things differently, but I've done it. And it's not that they don't care. But the routine becomes more important than the person that's right in front of them. The person. So the question that that I have for myself is, do my routines and my traditions that I've allowed in my life, does that prevent me from helping someone who might need it most? Hey, you, you've been there like me before, maybe. You, you've gone and you've asked people for help. I'm talking about, you know, the system now. And I know this, it's hard to define the system. Okay, what system? What, what system are you talking about? You know, if, if you don't have the right paperwork or you don't have the right things to fill out or, or you don't have the right whatever and you've got to jump through a million different hoops to get somewhere, now, I get it. We have response to things, but you know what? You're going to get a bill in the mail once they work you through the system. If first responders come or they have to do life flights and, and all this, everything's tracked in the system and, and everything has to be paid for in the end and, and there's always a cost and somebody has to bear that brunt, taxpayers or you know others that are carrying that weight. What if there's a legitimate need and uh, we don't have time to wait on the system? I don't know how to express this to you, but... But, but I'm a little bothered at times by the systems that we put in place. The institutionalism that's all around us. <laughs> systems are good in their right place. Systems help us accomplish things. We need systems to be some, you know, somewhat organized. We need systems to track things. We need machinery. We need tools. I guess what I'm frustrated more with is how often the mechanical dictates over the person. You don't believe me? Just go down the halls of any assisted living place or somewhere and and just start asking, hey, how's it going here? Go into the corridors of these institutions and ask, you know, how's it going with the system? <laughs> You'll probably get an earful. You could probably write a novel. You probably write it. Go down to the state house and ask them, hey, how's it working with this system? You know, you got this codification of all these laws for Colorado. How's that working out? Voluminous. And I can't even tell you half of what's in there anymore. Because they're trying to change it all. In the past few years, everything that 
that was down there. <laughs> Probably they've got to make new new volumes of new uh, volumes of volumes of stuff. The system. How's that working out? You know, Jesus is uh, is is leading somewhere. So I'm going to make an end run with you. I'm going to go to a parable that he gave that I think encapsulates what we're encountering in in, in the the seminal phase. What we're seeing in Luke 6 are the seeds that will blossom into this parable. Just turn ahead in Luke chapter number 10. And let me give you Jesus' illustration of what I tried to inadequately illustrate with our life here today. This is the illustration Jesus selected. And as one, uh, one pastor told me years ago, anytime you can use a biblical illustration, always use that biblical illustration because it's infallible. All other human illustrations will break down at one point or another, but God's Word is infallible. So think about this infallible, inerrant, inspired illustration that Jesus used. In Luke chapter 10 and verse number 25, we have a whole backstory here that we need to understand as well. The 70 have returned and, and they've been sent out by Jesus. They're rejoicing that they've had power to do all these things. And Jesus says, no, you need to rejoice that your names are written. Your names are written. Not that you have power to do all of this stuff. But that your names are written in heaven. And... Um, he speaks to his disciples privately. He tells them about things which they can expect. And then in verse 25, there's this lawyer that stands up and tempts Jesus. And he says, Master, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? So here's Jesus' illustration. He said unto him, What is written in the law? How readest thou? He answering said, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, and with all thy strength, and with all thy mind, and thy neighbor as thyself. And he said unto him, Thou answered right. Thou answered what? Right. This do, and thou shalt live. But he, willing to justify himself. Oh, I'm really good at that too. I'm really good at that at times. We get that down to a science. Said unto Jesus, <clears throat> And who is my neighbor? Jesus answering and said, A certain man went down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell among thieves, which stripped him of his raiment and wounded him and departed, leaving him half dead. And by chance there came down a certain priest that way, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. And likewise a Levite, when he was at the place, came and looked on him and passed by on the other side. But a certain Samaritan, as he journeyed, came where he was, and when he saw him, he had compassion on him and went to him. He didn't go on the other side. He went to him, bound up his wounds, pouring in oil and wine, set him on his own beast and brought him to an inn and took care of him. And on the morrow when he departed, he took out two pence and gave them to the host and said unto him, Take care of him. And whatsoever thou spendest more, when I come again, I will repay thee. Which now of these three thinkest thou was neighbor unto him that fell among the thieves? How are you going to answer, Mr. Mr. Lawyer, Mr. Self-righteous, self-justifying, trying to trick Jesus with your question, Lawyer? How are you going to answer? Be careful how you answer. And he said, the only thing that's the only thing he can say, he that showed mercy on him. He that showed mercy on him. Then said Jesus unto him, Go, and do thou likewise. In Luke chapter 6, verses 6 through 11, can I tell you, this is not a parable 
of of a good Samaritan going by and seeing somebody and helping. This is this is an actual account of Jesus leaving heaven and coming to earth to visit a man with a withered hand and went out of his way in grace into this synagogue right into the middle of the uh, the bear trap of the Pharisees And it doesn't matter to Jesus. There's one thing that matters to Jesus. He calls this man forward and he says, rise up. It's time for you to come stand in the midst. Stretch forth thy hand. This isn't a story about someone doing something. This is a real thing. Jesus really did this. He went to this man and helped him. Because Jesus had compassion on him. Jesus extended mercy where others extended rigid legalism. I mean, couldn't have you waited waited just a few hours? All he has to do is wait until sunset, 6 p.m. Hey, maybe we're watching the clock. How's your hand doing? Okay, 6 o'clock, just hold on. 6 o'clock's coming, just 6 o'clock's coming. Just hold on. We can't do it because it's the Sabbath. It's the Sabbath. We can't do it. But 6 o'clock is coming soon. Okay, and you're counting the seconds down. 6 p.m. hits, and it's no longer the Sabbath. Okay, let's help him. We chuckle at that, but this was real. Here he is in the synagogue on the Sabbath day. The sacred day that was meant for rest for God's people. A a sacred day that was meant for worship for them. And the Pharisees, these strict keepers of Sabbath law, they're watching, and that word watching is interesting, they're watching closely because they want to catch Jesus breaking the rules. I use air quotes. Can I use air quotes on the rules? You understand what rules those are. So is Jesus going to follow tradition? We know He's not going to follow the tradition of the Sabbath that they've imposed and keep all those rules. But this is what they have to ask in their mind. Will He do this? Will He keep the Sabbath tradition? Or is He going to break those boundaries and show compassion to a man who is in desperate need of healing, in desperate need of His touch? What will Jesus do? WWJD, what would Jesus do? Can I rephrase that for us here today with what Jesus says here and kind of put it in my own terms? I think, you know, if we have that mentality, it's great, you know, ask, what would Jesus do in this situation? That's all fine and well, but I think Jesus would come to you and ask you the question he asked them. He would come and say, what's the right thing to do? What's the right thing? I had to ask myself this uh, just this morning. I had to ask myself a similar question. Because I thought of about five different ways that I I could get from point A to point B when I was trying to get here this morning. I was trying to figure things out. I'm trying to plan ahead and be like, okay, if I do this, we can rearrange this. and I can... and, and. And I thought about all these different angles in which I could pursue something, and then I stopped myself and I said, but wait a minute. I need to be asking myself, what's the most selfless thing that I could do right now? Because there was somebody else that was with me this morning that I was trying to figure things out for both of us in some ways. And it was small. I mean, this is, I don't want to tell you what it was because I don't want you, you know, judging me. Don't judge me, okay? Um, But I had to ask myself, I I could do this this way. I could do this this way. What's the most selfless thing that I could do right now? It might cost me some more. It might cost me some time. It might cost me more energy. I might have to go the distance when it'd be easier for me to just take this shorter path and and I could get from point A to point B. But what's the most selfless thing? Is that going to help the other person that's with me right now? So not necessarily what would Jesus do, but, but... More importantly, what's the right thing to do? Let that be what guides us. How often do we let our routines, our traditions, prevent us from doing good? 
the Pharisees faced this same thing. And Jesus has a challenge for them, and He has a challenge for each of us if we'll hear it. To act with compassion. To act with compassion. So I want to challenge us to do some self-examination of our own lives, of our own practices, and yes, let me specify, even our own religious practices, whatever we want to call those to be, because that contextually that's what Jesus is dealing with. Are we sometimes like the people on that busy street? Are we sometimes like that priest? Are we sometimes like that Levite? Pass by on the other side, just avoid the whole thing, just pass around. Are we too busy? Are we too focused that we can't notice the needs around us? Do we, like the Pharisees, prioritize tradition dangerously, prioritize tradition and rules over opportunities to show compassion and mercy? Are we, would Jesus call us guilty? I don't know. But what Jesus does in this account challenges us to thoughtfully and carefully break Those kind of boundaries. Hear me well. There are boundaries that God has given us that are immovable. There are things that should never change. I will never stop studying from, reading, preaching, and teaching from the King James Bible. I just won't do it. I'll never stop yearning for and doing everything I can to promote good, godly, Christ-honoring music. I don't think you'll ever convince me to stop trying to put on the best thing I have in my closet for God on Sundays. So there's certain things that I'm just, I'm I'm not going to change. But am I going to let those things ever become tradition so it's to the point that it's legalism? Joke was made. Joke was made this weekend. We were at a men's retreat, and somebody said it. I probably shouldn't repeat it, but one of the speakers said, "You know, it used to be days ago. You could tell where somebody went to college by the way they comb their hair." I, I didn't say that. You know, they said that. So, <laughs> some of you remember those days. You know, hey, comb your hair in a way that honors God. That's what I'm going to tell you. Whatever you wear, be modest and represent Christ well as an ambassador. But let's be careful to not let our traditions put us in the place of the Pharisees. We could become just as guilty, I think. So we want to be careful if we talk about breaking any kind of boundaries. What boundaries are we talking about? I'm not talking about God's clear boundaries in His Word. Those are, those are immovable. But Jesus didn't break those boundaries either, did He? He didn't violate what God had said in His Word. No, in fact, um, He reclaimed that whole Sabbath idea back from from their traditionalism. He reclaimed that. And and I thought about this. This this was mind-blowing to me. I'm like, wow, how did I not see that before? You know, Jesus Jesus kind of took this whole Sabbath thing, right? And He reclaimed it. From, from their traditionalism, from their legalism. How did that work out? How, did it, how was he able to do that? Because uh, right after this passage, okay, context, right after this, what's Jesus about to do? Uh, we'll study it later as, as we move down the road, but he's about to call what Luke terms are apostles, and Luke's the one that uses the word apostles. He's about to call the twelve And we know from certain Old Testament prophetic passages that these 12 apostles uh, weren't to replace the promises of Abraham to Israel, not in that regard, but it was to reclaim Israel, in a sense, back 12 apostles, 12 tribes of Israel. So the church hasn't replaced Israel, but in a sense what Jesus is doing is, uh, is paving the way for both the foundation stones and the gates that we read about in Revelation. And how's he going to get from point A to point B? He takes what's been corrupted and he redeems it. He takes the synagogue and turns it into the local New Testament Bible-believing, and I'm going to say independent fundamental Baptist church, (laughs) turns it into our gatherings. He takes what they were doing on Saturday, the day of the end of the week, And he says it's a new beginning, and he says we're going to worship on Sunday. 
And uh, the Sabbath is always Saturday, so please don't misunderstand that. But uh, our day of worship celebrates the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Every Sunday we celebrate the truth that He is not here. He is risen, as He said. And through the 12 apostles who are going to take the gospel to the ends of the earth, He redeems what was corrupted. And right after this, 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 that's why I say this is, this is one of those turning moments. The Pharisees had it right at their fingertips. Jesus came and took up the message of John the Baptist and said, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And all they had to do was reach out and take the kingdom of God from Jesus by faith and receive Him by faith as the Messiah. And they said, who does He think He is? Nobody can forgive sins but God alone. Who does He think He is? Why are your disciples doing this? John's disciples didn't do it that way. The Pharisees fast twice in a week. Why are you doing things this way? They didn't receive that offer. So Jesus says, you've sealed your fate. And the Pharisees, the scribes, rejected Jesus, the son of David. They rejected him. So then right after this, he goes and says, all right, guys, come on forward. You're going to become the apostles and I'm going to send you out because now we're in this, uh, this, this waiting period. They're going to kill me. They're going to crucify me. But one day I'll come again and the kingdom that I've promised will be realized and all things will be consummated. The son of David will sit upon the throne of David and rule and reign. But in the meantime, he's going to give them the commission to do what the religious leaders were supposed to be doing all along. And they abdicated their responsibility and denied in unbelief, blasphemed the Holy Ghost and sealed their fate. Wow. Because they let their traditions blind them. They let their routines prevent them from seeing the person that was right in front of them who needed help. And then they couldn't even see the Messiah who had come to do exactly what He said back in Luke 4. That's what Jesus is doing here, helping. So I think the theme becomes simple but profound. Mercy always takes precedence over legalism. Mercy always takes precedence over legalism. I was told by people smarter than me not to use absolutes. I just used an absolute. Does it always? Is there ever a time? Can you think of a time where it would ever be okay for legalism to trump mercy? Can you ever think of a time when we should be more rigid in our traditions and routines and forego mercy? That is a hard question to answer because what if you're sitting on the other side of an administrative desk someday and there's a disciplinary matter that has to come to you and it's on your shoulders to decide what to do? Pray for our magistrates. They have their hands tied and they have their work cut out for them. Pray for our city officials. Pray for our government officials who have to make some of the hardest decisions every day. How can they know when to extend mercy? <laughs> Simple, profound, hard to do. We don't have perfect knowledge like Jesus does. We have systems for a reason, but mercy always takes precedence over legalism when you're dealing with these kind of contextual things here. Compassion and love for others, these are the things that ought to guide us, even when it challenges our traditions and routines. And so what we see here is, is more, it's about more than simply healing a man's dilapidated hand 
I couldn't find a good synonym for withered. I'm sorry, I tried, I looked. Dilapidated was as close as I could come because I, well, the first one I wrote down was uh, decrepit, and I thought, well, that's unkind of the guy because we're not told if he's old or not, you know. <laughs> decrepit kind of has the idea of, you know, it's aged and it's become decrepit, but I don't know, I, the withered hand, <laughs> you know, you read the word study helps and it just tells you dried up. This is his right hand. Luke is specific. The beloved physician is specific. He says it's his right hand. You might be left-handed. My wife is left-handed. And uh, left-handed people are very capable of things. But in a right-handed society, especially in this day and time, if you, if you can't use your right hand in, in this day and time, I think that's why Luke points it out because it's important detail. This is a genuine disability for this man. He can't do normal things, maybe like he once used to be able to do normal things that you can do as a right-handed person living in this society and this day and time. Maybe we've gotten away from it some, but I remember as a, as a kid growing up and having a hard time finding things like left-handed guitars and you know, left-handed. My dad was left-handed, so he was always looking for these things. And sometimes he had to have things custom-made because he was left-handed. Left -handed. South paws. So we might, might get a sense of that. But I think it's compounded. Can you imagine? Can you imagine? This man's hand needed healed. But I think there's more that needed healing. Think this through with me. Can we allow God to heal our finite understanding of what it truly means to live by God's law of love? Think the New Testament through. Jesus is going to command His disciples certain things. He's going to tell them things like, by this shall all men know that you're my disciples. Help me out. What is it the by this? What, by what shall all men know that we're His disciples? If we have one for another. I like to put it this way. If we're one anothering well, <laughs> then people will know we're following Jesus. If we have love one for another. Beloved, love is of God because God is love. We loved Him because He first loved us, gave Himself for us. Compassion. <laughs> that Samaritan saw this man that had fallen among thieves and had compassion. Jesus saw this man with the withered hand I don't know, maybe he was being a good back row Baptist that day. You ever done that? He comes in, maybe, you know, how many times has this guy gone to synagogue? Well, every Sabbath probably, because that's what you do. You just go to synagogue on Sabbath. How many times has he kind of slept, slipped in the back and you know, maybe sitting back where nobody can see him and, you know, ease in and ease out? We get good at doing that sometimes. We don't want attention drawn to ourselves. And here's this man on this day. It's different. The Pharisees are watching. They've put a trap, if you will. Now, I don't know if the guy was a plant. I, I did try to answer that, but I couldn't, I couldn't come to a solid answer on whether he was planted there or not. And I read some that say he were, some that say he wasn't a plant necessarily, but uh, I think we're missing the, the details that Luke gives us. The man was there, and the Pharisees were watching. That's the point Luke wants us to see. The problem wasn't with Jesus. The problem wasn't with the man. The problem wasn't with them gathering on Saturday to do their worship. That wasn't the issue. The, the issue that Luke says is they watched him, and the sense behind that word is they were laying in wait, trying to trap him, to catch him breaking the Sabbath on, on a, in, in a way that they could use against him to accuse him, and to run the gamut. And this has been brewing, right? This has been brewing all the way back from when he uh, healed, he forgave that man's sins. <laughs> and then he eats with publicans and sinners. I mean, who does this guy think he is? 
forgiving sins, saying that He can forgive sins, eating with publicans and sinners. And doesn't He know that sinners uh, are serving some kind of wrath from God? Because, I mean, that's how they wound up in the plight in their life to begin with, right? This guy's withered hand, hey, this isn't innocent in the mind of a Pharisee. But Luke, Luke doesn't tell us that this man was a sinner. He does point people out as being, as Brother Swanky says it, sinners throughout his gospel record. It just says this man was there and he had a withered hand. Was his hand withered because of sin? Well, if you asked a Pharisee, they would say there's no question about it. The only reason he has a withered hand is because either he sinned or his parents sinned. If he was born this way, John chapter 9 spells that out. Was this man born blind because of his parents' sin or because of sin that he did? That was their their mindset. So when they see Jesus eating with publicans and sinners and Him helping people, maybe you can understand a little bit of where they're coming from. I don't know, but imagine being in that synagogue there that day. The room is full. You've got you know everybody who somebody is there you got these devout religious Jews, uh, many of them who are conscientiously following to the letter. Not only the law of Moses, but everything the Pharisees and scribes have spelled out too. And in their zeal to protect their sacred traditions, they've surrounded it with layers upon layers of rules, layers of prohibitions, And right into the middle of that environment steps Jesus, who he'd already gained fame. His reputation is already spreading abroad, and he's stirring up these controversies that uh, these very traditions that these religious leaders hold dear, the, the controversy centers around those. So he sees this man with a withered hand. Look back at verse number eight. Uh, verses 6 through 8, it came to pass also on another Sabbath that he entered into the synagogue and taught, and there was a man whose right hand was hithered, and the scribes and Pharisees watched him whether he would heal on the Sabbath day that they might find an accusation against him. But he knew their thoughts and said to the man which had the withered hand, verse number 8, rise up and stand forth in the midst. And he rose stood forth. As you picture this scene, we can't help but see this man with a withered hand now. Nobody's been paying attention to him up to this point, maybe. Every Saturday he's come, he's been there. People probably know that he has a withered hand, but Jesus calls him front and center. Here he is, he's sitting, you know, maybe in the in the back, trying to blend in, knowing that you know what he what he's dealing with makes him a target for pity, and he's not asking for anybody's pity. But Jesus sees him. His hand shriveled and useless. The daily reminder, every day he gets out of bed, it stares him in the face. A daily reminder of his weakness, of his infirmity a reminder of his affliction. I don't know what he came to synagogue expecting that day. Maybe to have some worship. I mean, how many Sabbaths had he gone and left with the same condition? Going into the service, leave the service, no change. Get up the next morning, get up Sunday morning for him, and still staring at his withered hand, shriveled up, useless. Now here comes Jesus. Amen? Here comes Jesus. And the Pharisees, you know, I don't know if they like physically moved their posture, but you can almost see them like. I just, I try to imagine these scenes. Watch dogs, man. They are like on it. You've never been in a room like that, I guess, and felt the eyes on you from other watchdogs like, I don't know, I, I do that sometimes. I sit, sit in places and I just kind of observe, and I'm like, man, I, it's tense in here. Like somebody, somebody's like watching this thing going on here, and I better be careful. Like, I better not, like, Lord help me if I have to cough. 
what if I have to get up and use the restroom? <laughs> What's he going to do? They're watching. Every eye of Pharisee is trained on Jesus' every move. But why? Because they know his reputation. He has already healed others. And this is it. They've decided in their hearts that they are ready to accuse him of breaking the Sabbath if he dares to heal this man. With their legalistic mind, they're considering his healing as work on the Sabbath. And you can't do work on the Sabbath no matter the circumstances, uh, unless someone's life's in danger. They could go save somebody's life. You can read the Mishnah and, and, and see that you know, it was loud. Even if you had to break the door, you could go get, get somebody that uh, if their life was in danger. But this guy's just got a withered hand. His life's not in danger. So they're thinking, eh, we'll just wait till Sabbath runs out. And, and you see this sentiment really in Luke 13 at another incident where that woman is bowed over. And that's another huge turning point in Luke. And the, the, the ruler of the synagogue says, hey, you've got six other days in the week to heal. Why are you doing this on the Sabbath? So that lets you in on their mind a little more. What does Jesus do for us here? He shows us that doing good is always the right choice. Even when it challenges established norms and traditions, mercy and compassion should take precedence over rigid rule-keeping. Here, here they are. They believe they're the defenders of the law, but in their strict interpretation, have they not lost sight of the law's true purpose? Why did God give that Sabbath observance? To them, this man with the withered hand becomes less important than all their rules, and he becomes a pawn in their game to try to trap Jesus, and their hearts are so hardened by their legalism. They would rather see this man remain in his broken condition than see Jesus perform a healing that would, in their view, desecrate the holy day. So just pause right there. Feel the tension in the synagogue that Saturday. You could cut it with a knife. They're filled with anticipation. He's about to do it. He's about to do it. But that anticipation is accompanied with malice. Dry eyes. Malice. Can you imagine what that man with the withered hand feels like as he has to go stand in front of everybody? Feeling the weight of their gaze? Everybody's watching. What will Jesus do? What's He going to do? Because if He heals the man, the Pharisees are ready to pounce. Here they come. But if He does nothing, how in the world will He be true to His mission of compassion and mercy that He's already spelled out He's come to do? I have come. This day is a Scripture fulfilled in your ears. I've come to do what? To bind up the brokenhearted, to set the captive free. He'd come to do, to do those things. So now, even inaction on Jesus' part would send a message, wouldn't it? What's Jesus going to do? So there's confrontation brewing, and um, it's not what the Pharisees expect. And I love that about Jesus. He's just masterful. He comes and turns everything on its head. They had no idea what Jesus is about to do to them. And you've got to see this, right? They are trying to trap him and make him out to be the bad guy. And who's going to wind up being the bad guy at the end of this? Not Jesus. The very ones who are trying to trap him will be exposed for their wicked heart. They have turned a day of rest and worship into an oppressive burden. And in doing that, they have missed the very heart of God. They have missed the heart of the law. They have missed mercy, compassion. They've missed this opportunity of restoration, reparation, 
That's a terrible word to use today, isn't it? They're prioritizing the letter of the law, their law, mind you, and Jesus shows us the spirit of the law, compassion and love for others. The letter killeth, the spirit, it is life. So we can, we can maybe put our mind around it a little bit. It's, you have this man with a withered hand, but there's more that's withered than just his hand. You talk about shriveled and dried up religion. That describes the Pharisees to a T. Shriveled and dried up in their religion. Can't even see the truth of God staring them in the face. Valuing tradition over the love of God. And Jesus is about to teach them how gracious. He is about to teach them the nature of God's law. We don't have to look too far to see that same tension around us today. So think about where we live in our in our world, if you will. Where are we guilty of the same things they might be? You know, maybe that's the wrong way to, to look at it, okay? I would hope that we would be a different character in this story. <laughs> Who do you want to be? You want to be the man with the withered hand that gets healed? Who do you want to be? You want to be everybody else in the synagogue that's rejoicing when the, when the Pharisees aren't? You know, we're cheering Jesus on. Go get them, Jesus. Maybe that's you in the crowd. Maybe. The last person we want to be is the Pharisees. <laughs> the last person we want to be. I'll be somebody else in the story. I don't want to be the Pharisees. Let's not be. We can, we can change that. We can have our future rewritten. We can exhibit the heart and compassion of Jesus toward one another in a way that, that doesn't lead us to put tradition over people. One of the things we do to try to combat these mentalities, we do it every staff meeting, and, and I kind of program this in our staff meetings. I forget who I picked it up from along the way, but the first thing we talk about in our staff meetings are people. What's going on in God's people? I want to hear, how are people doing? And then we'll talk about how the services go. What are the mechanical things we need to adjust? We'll get into the mechanics. We'll get into the administration of all that. But we want to put people first. Because I don't ever want to wind up like this. We're constantly navigating between um, what we feel we should do and, and what our hearts tell us is the right thing to do. You, you encounter this in your workplace. I know because I did, and you and I probably don't live too far apart, but you ever been to a place where they kind of like have all these unwritten codes? <laughs> and if you're not part of the know, if, if you like, it depends on who you know, and, and if you're not on the in crowd, you like miss out. I, I, had, a, I had a lady in the in the USO office kind of take me because she must have felt sorry for me for some reason, but she started talking to us about some things that only insiders know this, okay? You're getting inside knowledge. And it was dealing with some pretty important things like how to retire properly after 20 years of being in the military. Did you know that there are certain things that you can do and you can count this, and a lot of people don't know that you can count this other thing and it'll count towards your 20 years. A lot of people have missed out on that because... Well, they just didn't follow those unwritten rules. You got those in your workplace? We had some. We had un I've had unwritten rules everywhere I've gone. You know, you, you find out you find out how to get in there and work those unwritten things and you navigate things a little better. You find out real quick when you uh when you step over the boundaries of those unwritten rules. I learned really, really quick. Never ever walk down the center idol of the Senate in the State House. It might be written down somewhere, but uh, we found out the hard way because the coat of arms, you know, the sergeant at arms came and was like, <laughs> I mean, we were about to get executed on the spot. I mean, you, like lightning coming from the, chandel, the brass chandeliers in the State House <laughs> right down on us. You stepped in the middle aisle of the Senate. <laughs> 
Hey, there's a reason behind that. If you want to know why, go ask a senator who's been down there long enough to know the story as to why they don't allow anybody to walk down the center aisle of the Senate chamber. Unwritten rule. Unwritten. But I've got an urgent message. Someone out here is, I don't know what the urgent message is. There is no message urgent enough to violate walking down the center aisle of the Senate chamber. It doesn't matter if you name it. So you see, you see, your workplace, you probably have similar things. I'm, that's hyperbole. I'm, I'm, I'm like, you know, exaggerating on purpose because I want you to feel it. You know, maybe I should talk to some folks who have been visiting the church and things and, and maybe sit down and have coffee with them and ask, you know, you've been here for a little while. What would you say are some of the unwritten rules we have around here? Oh, you better not ever go this way because, uh, I don't know, do we have any of those? We probably do because we're people like everybody else. Well, you know, you just, I can't go back to that church because I don't fit in. I can't keep all those unwritten things. Lord, help us. Lord, help us. Hopefully you hear my heart beat on this. Sometimes it's not just the rules we're bound by, those unwritten rules, those things that become traditions. Sometimes it's fear of judgment, fear of being criticized, fear of uh, you know, the fire coming down on us if we step out of line anywhere. We want to be good people. We want to be good people, don't we? You should say amen to that. We want to do what's right. Deep down inside, we don't want to hurt people. But sometimes the fear of consequences, whether it's social consequences, professional consequences, religious consequences, if you call them that, keep us from having the compassion that Christ would want us to have, the mercy that He demonstrated this day when He called that man in the midst and you know, that phrase in the midst has always been special to me because when I see it, I usually see Jesus in the midst. Jesus in the midst of His church. Jesus in the midst of the disciples. And He challenges him. He calls that man. Now what's He going to do? He comes forward with His hand. Everyone, everyone's eyes are on Him and He's standing there okay. That man was brave. That man did what Jesus told him to do and stopped thinking about what everybody else thought. The only person that mattered to him that day was Jesus because he'd heard what Jesus could do. And when Jesus said, Arise, he said, My number's been called. And he came and he stood in the midst and became a living sermon to everyone in that room that day and to you and I today. He stands as a living sermon. Jesus said, stretch forth thy hand. And he did. And it was as whole as his other hand. The physician tells us that. It was as whole immediately as his other hand. Amazing. And verse 11 is the tragedy, right? Like We want to say, yes, the shot across the bow. Jesus did it. He healed him. And the Pharisees should have been cheering him on. They were mad. That's a good translation of the King's English. Mad. Used to, you know, people understood the connotation of the word mad. If somebody called you mad, you know, like the Mad Hatter. <laughs> yeah, thanks, Lewis Carroll. Cheshire Cat, you know, all that crazy. The guy's crazy. The Mad Hatter's crazy. It, okay, help me out. Is the Mad Hatter crazy or is the Mad Hatter crazy? You only got two choices there. Okay, yeah, double crazy. <laughs> mustard? <laughs> Who eats mustard? <laughs> Maybe you like mustard. Huh. I don't mean to make light of this because this is as serious as it gets, friends. 
These are the religious leaders of Israel, and they have just been blinded by their madness. They can't think clearly. And that happens to you when you get mad about something. You stop thinking rationally. Come on now, help me out. Let's all get honest here and be honest with ourselves because God already knows the truth. When you get mad about something, man, you can't think straight. Things start happening, you have to go back and apologize, you know, umpteen times afterward and be like, uh." no, this is just me. Okay. They can't think clearly. And this clouding of their mind, the the word literally is mindless, like without thinking. They're in a rage where they can't think straight. And they commune together. As you know, a lot happens when you get a bunch of mad people in the same room and they start counseling on what they're going to do. Boy, if you get a group of people mad, we're talking about mob rule now. Uh, We need to pray. We need to pray for people around our country as we approach November. Because people start losing their mind and they start losing the ability to think rationally. Sometimes they become violent. Sometimes they crucify innocent people along the way. Consequences. Jesus was never concerned about keeping up appearances. He wasn't worried about how the religious leaders were going to judge Him. His mission was always clear. Restore, heal, love, even if it meant challenging the status quo. And that's the challenge that confronts us today. We have verses 9 through 11. I really haven't uh, unpacked for you in depth, but here we are. We have this mixture of hope and uncertainty. What's going to happen here? We've heard about Jesus. We've heard about what's he, you know, what he's done in the past. What's he going to do today? He calls this man forward. He heals him. And, uh, and he asks, before he does that, he asks the most piercing question. He says, I'll ask you one thing. Don't you love how Jesus does that? It's, there's two question marks in my English translation, but it's one thing. It is one thing. I'll ask you one thing. And here's, here's what he asks. Is it lawful on the Sabbath days to do good or to evil or evil, to do evil, to save life or to destroy it? You got to see Jesus in this because he could have avoided the whole thing. He didn't have to do this. He he could have allowed this man to stay in his condition a little longer. He could have carried on with his teaching. That's not who Jesus is. He isn't interested in preserving the traditions of the Pharisees at the expense of God's people. That's not Jesus. He sees this man in his need and he acts with a word. He tells this man, stretch out thy hand. And right in front of everybody that day, his hand is restored completely, immediately, undeniably made whole. Transformed. I like to believe that it started from the inside out because he had faith to go and stand up in front of everybody because he believed in Jesus. No longer, when this guy leaves the synagogue that day, day, no longer will people see him as the man with the withered hand. Hallelujah, praise God. When I got off my face as a 14-year-old young man, when I stand before the throne of God, he'll no longer see me for the sinner I used to be. Because Jesus saved me. Jesus took my withered, dried up, sin-cursed life and He gave me life where there was death. He wasn't concerned about keeping the traditions of the Pharisees. No longer seen as the man with the withered hand. No longer limited by his condition. Healed, restored, made whole. And it all happened on the Sabbath. (laughs) The day when no work was supposed to be done. 
It happened on the Sabbath. It's not as big a deal to us because we don't we don't live there, but man, this was a big deal. They're watching Jesus, and the Pharisees are watching him with ill intent. They stand ready to pounce to accuse him. And yet, look what Jesus does in grace and in love and in mercy. He still teaches them. If I were there, and I'm glad God's not me. I know a synagogue that would have gotten wiped off of God's green earth that day. I'm so glad God's not like me. Jesus says, let me show you guys a lesson. You religious leaders, let me teach you the heart of God. Even though they're not going to receive it and they're blinded by their anger, their madness, they can't even see the truth staring them in their face. Jesus holds the truth right out in front of them and says, here's another opportunity for you to turn around. Hey, God has an opportunity for you to turn around today. God has an opportunity for you to be transformed. God has an opportunity for His life to go forth through you. Imagine what it would have been if if these Pharisees would have gotten it. One of them, it starts to click. Now, I don't know. I haven't figured it out. I might have to do a little harmonization a little better to remind uh, remind myself, where in the world does Nicodemus fit into this? When's the trigger point? What's the moment where Nicodemus is like, man, i I got to go talk to him. I know I can't talk to him openly. I'm going to go by night, but I've got to talk to Jesus because no man doeth these miracles that thou doest except God be with him. And we hear this from the Pharisee conversations and they're saying you're not of God and, and, and everybody else is acknowledging you're of God and Nicodemus is torn. Can you imagine what would it have been if uh, if they would have gotten it? I wonder what the next verses would look like as Jesus selected his apostles. I don't think it would have changed the plan, you know, God's sovereign, but uh but you know God's will can be thwarted down here. And you're seeing God's will being thwarted on this earth because of the hardness of heart and unbelief of the Pharisees, and it angers God when men stand in the way of the work He wants to do. You want to know what angers God? Unbelief. Hardness of heart. It not only angers Him, it grieves Him. In His spirit, He groans. So think back to that injured person on the busy street. Think back to to that Samaritan in the story Jesus told. Here's Jesus. He he restores this man's hand. Jesus is still in the business of healing and restoring us today, friend. Both physically and spiritually, He can do it. We don't limit God in any way. We're surrounded. We are surrounded by people with withered hands. Look around your life. What would you say is... uh, we would, we would classify as, well, dried up. It's just kind of dried up. <laughs> we live in a dry and thirsty land. Who would you classify as hurting, broken, in need of mercy today? Too often, like the Pharisees, we get caught up in our own routines, in our own practices, religious or otherwise. We get caught up in our own personal agendas and we miss the opportunity to extend God's grace to those around us. Jesus didn't come to show us merely what grace looks like. He came to empower those that follow Him to live that grace out. You're going to check out Sunday morning, you know, I'm out of time already. We're going to move on. We're going to have lunch, and uh, life's going to take over. Monday morning's coming, and you're going to go do life this week. Will you remember the Sunday morning sermon? Will you have eyes to see the people that God put right in front of you? Maybe even before Sunday's over, maybe even today. 
Will you see them? Will you extend mercy and compassion? Or will you say, well, you know, we got to go back to church tonight, five o'clock, we got the routines. Well, we, you know, we got to get to work in the morning. Well, we got school. Well, we've got. Life's busy. Life's busy. But let's have mercy. Let's live this grace. The grace that we receive from Christ. Hey, you came today, and hopefully by spending time in the Word of God, God's touched your life. And He's given you something today, something through the song, something through the message. Come back tonight, you'll get more, and we'll try to feed you as much as we can. But don't go out here and, and just keep that to yourself. Take the grace, the rest, the peace, Take the gospel that Jesus has given you in this service and go give it to somebody. Go give it to somebody. Use those opportunities. Be a channel. Be a channel. And say, Lord, where do you want your blessing to go? Pour it out and just show me where to point your blessing. The man with the withered hand, is that you today? Is your life dried up? Jesus calls you forth and would say, stand in the midst, reach forth, and find life. You can be saved today. Many of you have already tasted that grace. And the Holy Spirit might be challenging you to live that out. There are those that are around us, and I ask you, where are the withered hands in our midst? Where are the people who need a touch of God's grace? But know this. By extending that grace, you may do so at a great cost. Others may not understand. It may mean some things. It may mean breaking those unwritten rules at times. It may mean we get out of our comfort zone. It may mean that we stop acting like everybody expects us to act. It may mean being criticized and misunderstood. But Jesus shows us that the risk is worth the reward. Why would He love me so? The risk is worth the reward. Jesus said, if any man will be my disciple, let him take up his cross and come after me. When you extend God's grace, because you get it, and others around you don't. And you say, God wants me to extend compassion and mercy. Here is God's grace. Now, now you're not Jesus, okay? We're not Jesus. We, we can't heal anybody. We, we, can't, we can't do what He did this day, but, but we can get them to Him. And He can do it for them. But when you do that, you become an extension of Jesus. And on Tuesday, you're probably going to have some people that just aren't going to understand why you're there doing what you're doing in the Good News Club. We, we have our John and Romans, and these missionaries take these Bibles out to, to foreign countries where they're going. There's probably going to be some people there that just aren't going to understand, why are these crazy Christians doing that to begin with? What are they doing trying to turn our, our city upside down with, with this message? You know... Um, <laughs> There just might be some governmental authorities that come into a place and want to shut it down and arrest pastors for preaching the gospel because they, they're out of their mind. They can't see that cost. The cost is worth the reward. But there's plenty of God's people that still believe that today. For the joy that was set before Him, He endured the cross despising the shame because he knew the reward would be worth it. Do you believe that God is? 
Do you believe that he's a rewarder of them that diligently seek him?